In this segment, let's deal with the next set of questions, starting with anti-diabetic drug, which is associated with B12 deficiency. So if you look into the adverse effects or the drawbacks of using metformin, in certain patients who are using metformin, there can be B12 deficiency due to n number of reasons which we'll go through now. So metformin, a bigonide, acts by decreasing the hepatic glucose output in fasting state. Initiation of metformin therapy can cause GI disturbances which can be reduced by starting a low dose therapy and then gradually increasing. Metformin is also reported as a pharmacological cause of B12 deficiency. It's estimated that 10 to 30 percent of patients undergoing metformin therapy develop evidences of vitamin B12 deficiency and another study has shown 22 percent prevalence of B12 deficiency in type 2 diabetes mellitus patients on metformin therapy. And the responsible mechanism for B12 deficiency in metformin users has been controversial but there are n number of probable mechanisms through which there can be B12 deficiency. One is competitive inhibition or inactivation of cobalamin absorption, alterations in intrinsic factor levels, bacterial flora, GI motility, interaction with cubulin endocytic receptor etc. So these mechanisms have been implicated as a probable pharmacological cause of B12 deficiency in patients on metformin right now let's move on to the next one we chose triad the classic which we have discussed n number of times in our e classes as well so we chose triad over 150 years ago a german pathologist rudolf Virchow postulated that thrombus formation and propagation resulted from abnormalities in three key areas as you can see blood flow vessel wall blood components so these three factors are known as Virchow's triad so as you can see hypercoagulable state circulatory stasis and vascular wall injury right so these are the components of Virchow's triad now moving on to ossifying fibroma radiographic features, I guess there was a question on the same. So ossifying fibroma is a rare benign fibroosseous neoplasm of jaw characterized by substitution of normal bone by fibrous tissues and newly formed calcified products such as bone, cementum or a combination of both bone and cementum. It's well demarcated lesion that differentiates it from fibrous dysplasia. And if you look into the radiographic features of ossifying fibroma, it's a well circumscribed lesion evidence of intracortical osteolysis with characteristic sclerotic band osteoblastic rimming moderate cortical expansion and homogeneous lesion matrix so some of the features of ossifying fibroma radiographically now moving on to Pitt Fisher Seelins uh, generations, fourth generation fluoride releasing. So if you look into the first generation, UV light cured, second generation is chemical cured or self cured, third generation is visible light cured, and fourth generation is fluoride releasing. Right? Now moving on to the next one, sharpness of radiograph can be increased by, we have discussed in detail about the same in our study club discussions. So what are the factors which can be altered to increase the sharpness of radiograph? So sharpness measures how well a boundary between two areas of differing radio density is revealed. So that's sharpness is all about and sharpness can be enhanced by using the following three means, use as small effective focal spot as possible so using a small effective focal spot as practical increases sharpness increase the distance between the focal spot and the object by using a long open-ended cylinder and minimizing the distance between the object and the image receptor so using these three means we can enhance the sharpness of a specific image on a radiograph right now, moving on to the next one, Young's formula regarding a dosage, drug dosage. So Young's formula helps us to calculate the child dose. And as you can see, that's the formula we have for calculating child dose, which is equal to adult dose into age in years by age plus 12, which gives the child dose, right? So that's Young's formula. Now moving on to the next one, difficulty index of impacted teeth. So difficulty score of a mesoangular class 2 position C mandibular third molar. So in fact we had a similar question previously also. So I'll just present you with the table and then you decide what's the appropriate answer. 
So if you look into the table, based on angulation, we have the following difficulty index. If it is mesoangular impaction, easiest to remove. So difficulty index score of 1. Horizontal or transverse 2. Vertical 3. Distroangular 4. And based on depth, we have level A, B and C with 1, 2 and 3 respective scores. And based on the space available or the Ramos relation, we have class 1, class 2 and class 3 with scores 1, 2, 3 respectively. So if you go into depth pertaining to the depth of this assessment. So position A, the highest position of tooth is on a level with or above the occlusal line. Whereas position B is highest position is below the occlusal plane but above the cervical level of a second molar. Position C is highest position of tooth is below the cervical level of a second molar. So based on this we have uh, position A, B and C in depth uh, column. And if you look into the relation of the space available, we have class 1, class 2 and class 3 relations where class 1 is sufficient space available between the anterior border of ascending ramus and the distal side of second molar for eruption of third molar. Class 2 is space available between the anterior border of ramus and distal side of second molar is less than the mesodistal width of the crown of third molar. It denotes the distal portion of third molar crown is covered by bone from the ascending ramus. And class 3 is third molar is totally embedded in the bone from the ascending ramus because of absolute lack of space. Right? So this difficulty index for removal of impacted lower third molars based on this scoring criteria you can get to a probable answer and i think the question is difficulty score for a mesoangular class 2 position c mandibular third molar so do uh, sum up all the values you'll get the answer right now moving on to the next question heart shaped cyst the one which we discussed a number of times in our a classes and even in our live sessions nasopalatal duct cyst not just heart it can be even oval shape as well so nasopalatal duct cyst also known as incisive canal cyst are the common in fact most common non-odontogenic cyst of gnathic bones cyst is so common in fact that will affect approximately one out of every 100 persons radiographically nasopalatal duct cysts are usually well circumscribed radiolucences of the anterior maxilla the cysts are apical to roots of maxillary incisors and rarely cause root resorption they are round ovoid or heart shaped due to superimposition of nasal spine so the heart shape is mainly because of superimposition of the nasal spine right now moving on to the next penultimate topic pdl traction so ligament traction is assisted by which of the following cells fibroblasts osteoblasts or endoblasts if you look into the theories of tooth eruption we have something called as periodontal ligament traction theory which states that eruptive forces reside in the dental follicle periodontal ligament complex formation and renewal of pdl has been considered a factor in tooth eruption because of traction power that fibroblasts have so according to this theory, fibroblasts do have traction uh, potential. However, this theory is not accepted because even impacted teeth with a well-developed PDL do not erupt. So the bottom line is the fibroblasts have this traction potential which could be assisting in tooth eruption according to periodontal ligament traction theory. Right? Now, moving on to the final topic. Perecision, also called as CSF. So what's this about? Perecision or circumferential supracrystal fibrotomy, right? To treat the cases of uh, relapse, especially when you are uh, rotating a tooth. So perecision or circumferential supracrystal fibrotomy, as it is often called, is a minor surgical procedure that's undertaken to counter the relapse tendency of stretched gingival fibers. The transeptal and allular crest group of gingival fibers remain stretched and do not readily readapt to the new tooth position following correction of rotations, hence causing relapse. Perecision involves surgical sectioning of these fibers by passing a sharp narrow scalpel through the gingival sulcus around the tooth to a depth of 2 mm apical to allular crest. Perecision is generally undertaken as an adjunctive retentive procedure after the correction of rotations. Right? So these are some of the topics which I wanted to highlight in this specific video. So we will come up with more videos covering more topics soon. I hope it's clear.